Okay, today we're talking about stock transactions, dividends, and stock splits. Um, I hope that you've looked uh, at the first uh, clip that is on the stockholders' equity section of the balance sheet. This is where I talked and explained about a lot of the accounts that we'll be using. And the first thing that we're going to look at is how to do journal entries. So you really need to be familiar with the accounts, um, for, somewhat familiarize yourself with them before we get into the journal entries. I hope you've downloaded the handouts that go with this. The first one is a problem, uh, some problems where we are issuing stock and how is that going to affect, um, how are these transactions going to affect the books and what the journal entries are going to be. So up here I have a general journal. All right. On May the 1st, it says the ABC company issued for cash 50,000 shares of $10 par common stock for $20. What journal entry is needed to record this transaction? All right, we have, um, we have two numbers in here. We have one for par value, and then it says we issued it for $20. Now, don't let that confuse you. If you remember, I talked about par value in the last clip. We talked about par value was established when the stock um, was originally, before it was even printed when we applied to the state, when the company would apply to the state to be able to issue stock. And it is an arbitrary number. But it does have to do with how we're going to record them on our books. Because par value is only going to, that's all that's going to go in the common stock account. The, the stock, we're going to issue that for as much as we can, what the market will, will bear. So market value could change, but the par value will not. And any cash that we get over and above when we issue it, over and above um, the par value goes into an account called paid in capital in excess of par. So when we begin to look at this, one of the things, um, I think I even talked about this when I talked about analyzing transactions and debit and credit parts, always ask yourself if cash is involved with a transaction. We did get cash here, didn't we? When we issued stock, we got cash. We can issue stock sometimes for other things, but in this case we've issued stock for cash and we got $20 per share when we issued 50,000 shares. So the cash part is going to be the easy part. We know when we issue the stock, we're selling it, cash is coming in, cash is an asset, increases in assets are recorded by debits. Um, how much are we going to debit cash for? 50,000 times 20. So let's see, the first thing I need over here is the date, which is May the 5th. And again, I'm going to debit cash. Remember, the right order is the cash. The debits go first. And we're going to be debiting that for 50,000 times 20, which would be a million dollars. Then we, what, what's going to go in the common stock account itself is the par value. So we're going to take that 50,000 times 10. The... Um, which is going to give us 50000 The common stock account is an equity account, and we, when we issue stock, we're increasing our equities. Increases in equities are recorded by credits, which means we're going to credit common stock. For $50,000. Okay, where is the remainder going to go? We know, I'm sorry, we're going to credit common stock for $500,000. So make a little extra zero in there. And where is the remainder going to go? We can see that this does not balance. The remainder goes into that account called paid in capital in excess of par. Now it says here that this is common stock. So we're going to actually, the, the full name of the account is going to be paid in capital in excess of par common stock. And that's a very long name. So I may use more than one line here to write in the name of paid in capital in excess of par common stock. It is an equity account. It is increasing and increases in equity are recorded by credits.
Okay, the excess, the one million minus the five minus the five hundred thousand, will give us five hundred thousand. Okay, looking at the next one, um, um, it says on August the fifteenth, the ABC company issued for cash eighty thousand shares of six dollars par preferred stock at ten dollars. What is the journal entry needed to record this transaction? Okay, this transaction is very similar to the first one, except that we're issuing preferred stock. Not a whole lot of difference in how we record this. Of course, first we're going to put the date, which is August the 15th. Okay, we're getting cash, right? Cash is coming in just like it was in the first one. We're issuing stock. The cash that came in, the 80,000 times, what did we sell it for? We sold it for $10 each. So 10 times 80,000 would give us $800,000 cash. Again, cash is coming in, increases in cash, which is an asset, would be a debit. All right, it says here we sold preferred stock, so that is our stock account here. There are two separate accounts, one for common stock and one for preferred stock. The par value of this preferred stock is six dollars. So we're going to take the eighty thousand times six to get the amount of the dollars that would go in the preferred stock account, which should give us four hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Preferred stock again is another equity account. Increases in equity because we are selling this stock are recorded by credit. So we're going to credit preferred stock for four hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Okay, the remainder of this, which is the difference, the amount um, in excess of par is going to go into an account called paid in capital in excess of par preferred stock. So yes, we have another paid in capital account. It is also an equity account. Very long names. There's very long names for these equity accounts. is, let's see, we have um, the difference between ten and six dollars would be four dollars uh, a share times eighty thousand, which would give us three hundred and twenty thousand. Or you could just subtract the, the uh, eight hundred thousand minus the four hundred and eighty thousand, and you have three hundred and twenty thousand left. So remember, these have to balance. Debits always have to equal credits. So if you add these two up, they should always these two credit credits up in the general the entry, the journal entry, it should always equal the debits. Now the next question says, what is the total amount invested by all stockholders of the ABC company as of August 30th? The total amount invested, well basically that means the total paid in capital, what's been paid in by the stockholders. Well it looks like all the cash we collected here was paid in by the stockholders. We simply we're selling common stock, issuing it. We were also issuing preferred stock. So if we add these two numbers up, if we just add our cash numbers up, we'd have one million plus eight hundred thousand, which is going to give us one million eight hundred thousand. And that is how much that um, is needed to answer that question. The total amount of investor, the total paid in capital. What equity account would not be included in? Um, total paid in capital. It's one every business should have and that's retained earnings. Retained earnings is the earnings of the company. So we also find that in the stockholders equity section. Right, I'm going to turn the page and we are going to talk about dividends. A dividend announcement. Dividends must be declared by the board of directors in a corporation. And there's three important dates that are included in a dividend announcement. So when the board of directors has a meeting, decides to declare a dividend, there's three dates. There's the date of declaration, the date of record, 
and the date of payment. What kind of entries do we need to make on our books for these three different dates? Again, they would all be in a dividend announcement. The date of declaration is the day that it's declared. The day they have the meeting and it's declared. And on that day, the, um, the dividend actually has to be recorded. If it's a cash dividend, it actually has to be recorded on the books. We would be using an account called cash dividends, um, which is, um, and we're going to debit it because it would actually reduce our equity. Increases in equity are recorded by credits, decreases recorded by debits. Then we're going to show the liability, cash dividends payable, which is a liability account. So we'll be crediting cash dividends payable. Again, that's the day that the, that the dividend, the cash dividend is announced. The date of record, that's the date, that, and there's, there's, again, this is uh, information that would be given in the dividend announcement. That's the date if you own the stock, if, you, if, it's, if they have you on their records, if the corporation has you on their records that day, you will be receiving the dividend. There could, it could be sold between the date of declaration and the date of record, but if you are the stockholder on the date of record, then you will be receiving the dividend. So this is, this is really just um, in, in the records of the company, and there's not any journal entry required to do. There's nothing that's changed about the dollar amounts. And then the third uh, day on here is the date of payment. Anytime we're paying something that's been recorded as a liability, which our cash dividends payable is a liability, we're going to be debiting the liability when we pay it. So the date of payment will be debiting, cash dividends payable, and crediting cash. And now that I've showed you this, let's go through a very simple problem. If you'll turn in your handout to the next page. It says the date of declaration, the date of, um, and the payment dates in connection with a cash dividend were July, June 1, July 1, and August 3. Journalize the entries recorded on each date. So on the date of declaration on June the 1st, what was it, 275000 I'm going to debit cash dividends for 275000 Again, this amount was given to me in the problem. And credit cash dividends payable for 275000 Again, on the date of record, there's nothing required. It says here the date of record is July the 1st. No entry is required. And on the date of payment, which would be down here on August uh, the 3rd, we're going to use that same number. We're going to be debiting cash dividends payable for 275000 and crediting cash for 275000 Stock splits. The last topic tonight is going to be on stock splits. And we're going to talk about the effect of a stock split. A company may split their stock for many reasons. Most of the time it's to get the value lower. So if the value of the stock is just so high they want to reduce it, they may split it. When I think about stocks, so usually splitting the stock is a good thing. That's a good sign if a company has split their stocks because if their stocks were really low, they would not want to split them. But when I think about stocks, I usually think about splitting stocks, I usually think about split ends in my hair. Just because uh, I, have split, I have split ends in my hair, does that mean that I have more hair growing out of the top of my head? No, not really, but it may look like at the bottom that I have more hair because some of my, my ends are split. And that's, it works the same way with the stock. When you split it, you really, if you own stock and the stock splits, you don't have any more ownership in the company than you did before the split. Yes, you will receive another piece of paper, so to speak. This is another piece of stock that you own. If it is a two-for-one stock split, how many ever sh shares of stock are outstanding will multiply by two. If it's a three-for-one stock split, how many ever shares are outstanding will be multiplied by three. If it's a four-for-one stock split, how many ever shares are outstanding will be multiplied by four. So the number of shares are going to increase when there is a stock split. However, the market value is going to decrease proportionally. If it's a two-for-one stock split, the market value 
you divide it by two. That's approximately what it's going to drop to. If it's a three for one, you divide the market value by three. If it's a four for one, you divide the market value by four. So let's look at the last problem here on our page, and it says the ABC company had 90,000 shares of common stock outstanding. They declared a two for one stock split. And you'll notice I put in parentheses one additional share for each share issued. The market price before the split was $200. The first question asks you, what will be the number of shares outstanding after the split? Okay, we had 90 shares outstanding, we had a two for one. If you remember, we're going to multiply it, it's going to go up, so we're going to take that 90,000 times two, which will give us 180,000. And what would be the approximate market price after the split if it's a two for one? It says here our, our market value is 200. We're going to take that $200 of market value and divide it by two which would give us $100 per share. And I hope that helps you on these topics of um, stock transactions, cash dividends, and stock splits.